Hi and welcome to High School Physics Explained and I'm Paul. I'm Simon. And I'm Tom. And today we're going to be looking at the physics behind spectroscopy in the basics of spectroscopy but also the applications of spectroscopy. Now before we start we need to discuss simply what light is. Now in one sense light is a wave, it's an electromagnetic wave. And so what we have here is an image that shows us the range of electromagnetic radiation. You can see if down one end we have gamma radiation and the other end we have radio waves. On the scale at the top and the bottom either the frequency or the wavelength. You can see that the visible spectrum, what is we refer to as light, is actually an extremely small portion of the electromagnetic range. I'll have another video at a later stage where I discuss more about the electromagnetic radiation as we understand it. The thing is light can be perceived as a wave with a range of frequencies and a range of wavelengths and the wavelength can be around as small as 380 nanometers and up to 750 nanometers for the very far end of the red end of the spectrum. Now what happens when light interacts with some sort of material? There's a number of things that can happen. The first thing that can happen is, is that it can be absorbed. So the energy of the light is absorbed by the material and the material might increase in temperature. The second thing that might happen is the light may be transmitted. So light passes straight through and glass is a good example of where light can be transmitted through the material. The third thing that can happen is that the light can be reflected. And of course objects that we see are generally seen because light reflects of the substance. But the reality is, is that although light can be absorbed by the material, some of that light may be re-emitted. So for example, the sun that we see, the light we see is because of light being emitted from the internal processes within its core. A light bulb or a light filament is emitting light due to the energy in the material of the filament. It's emitting light. But it's not so simple. When we have light coming through and being transmitted, it's not necessarily true that all the light is transmitted. So what you see may be a combination of things. So for example, light may be transmitted through, but some wavelengths of light may be reflected. Some wavelengths of light may be absorbed and then re-emitted. So what you see here and what you see here may be very different even though you may be looking at the same object. Light may be interacting with the object so that we can have emission and some transmission and some reflection as well. And that's what we want to particularly discuss. So what we need to do is find a way of spreading out our light into its different wavelengths or often referred to into its different spectra. In other words, by spreading out the wavelengths, we can examine which wavelengths are transmitted and which wavelengths are emitted if there's both processes going on. And for that, we need a spectroscope. And in simply put, a spectroscope will spread out the light and it can do it one of two ways. The first way is by what we refer to as dispersion. And the most common example of dispersion is when we look at a rainbow, light is dispersed, light is refracted through the material and refracts slightly different amounts depending on the wavelength. So a prism here causes a wavelength to spread out. This is a picture of Kirchhoff who examined light from a candle using a prism. In other words, he's relying on dispersion to spread out the wavelengths of the light. But another way we can do it is what we call diffraction. And diffraction is when light interacts with a surface. In this case, what we have is a diffraction grating that spreads out the light. Now, our soap bubble is actually an example of diffraction. Our CD discs and DV discs, which therefore have colors on them, is also an example of diffraction. Now I'm not going to go into details on the nature of diffraction. That will be a subject for another video. But it's another way that we can spread out some white light into its constituent wavelengths. So a spectroscope could be something so very simple. It could be a tube. And most likely within this tube, it could have a diffraction grating where the light therefore splits into its different colors and you may have that at school. 
but it could also be something a bit more complex like a spectrometer where you can actually look at each of the individual wavelengths by simply moving a scope around the spreading of the colors. If I move this around, you can see, I can see the different colors as I go through. Now this is not accurate and precise, but in essence, that's what a spectrometer does. It allows you to measure the angles and those angles are important to determine the wavelength that is in the light. And we'll explain that shortly. So now let's have a look at what type of spectra we might get for different sorts of situations. So here we have a, a light source, it could be the sun, it could be some sort of light source that gives off white light. That light will come out and we can examine that light using our spectroscope or a spectrometer. And so what we get is a spectrum. This is a continuous spectrum. In other words, we see all the wavelengths that are within the light. However, what happens if our white light encounters a substance? And in this case, we're going to make our substance a gas and it's going to be hydrogen gas simply for a, a good example. And this is often the case when we are examining stellar objects in terms of astronomy. What will the light look like when the light passes through and is examined through the spectrometer or the spectroscope? And what we get here is our spectrum, but it's no longer continuous. You'll notice that there are solid lines here. And that's because as the light passes through, some of the light is absorbed by the gas and some of the light is allowed to transmit through. So here we clearly have four key lines that are very unique wavelengths that are absorbed by my gas and therefore no longer appear on my spectrum. So we call this an absorption spectrum. But imagine I now have a spectroscope and I look at the light that's being emitted by my cloud. In other words, I'm not looking at the light that is remaining, I'm looking at what's left over. I'm no longer going to get this absorption spectrum. I'm gonna get something else and I'm going to get what we call an emission spectrum. So clearly we have no light from any of the wavelengths in between here reaching our spectroscope. We're only getting the light that is being emitted by the material. So what's that saying? Well, that means that we have certain wavelengths of light absorbed by my gas cloud and then they're being re-emitted and it's the same wavelength and it's the same frequency. And so what you'll notice is that these two are complementary. That is, this red line here corresponds to the red line over here. This purple violet line corresponds to this violet line. So these are very unique lines and these unique lines represent the wavelength of the emitted light coming off. Same here with the dark bands. So we have an emission spectrum, an absorption spectrum, and of course if there's no lines we have what we call a continuous spectrum. Now let's have a look at this image. This is the light that comes from our sun. What's it telling you? Well, our sunlight clearly isn't giving off all the colors of the rainbow, so to speak. We have significant lines through our spectrum. So it is an absorption spectrum. Now these lines are significant in that they tell us what gases the light is passing through as it reaches to Earth. Our sun is a gaseous star and so therefore what's happening is the light is interacting with the gases and because we can examine different gases here on the earth and reproduce the lines we can therefore determine the gases and the actual elements that are surrounding our sun because they're unique causing these lines. Here is a sodium lamp, a common street lamp. Because it's made up of a sodium gas, in this case, the light is only being emitted at very unique frequencies and therefore only at very unique wavelengths. And so therefore it has this characteristic color. But if we really wanted to analyze the light that is coming through that, we look at a spectrometer or a spectroscope to look at the emission spectrum. And so here we have our lines and you can see these lines are very few in number and predominantly they're in the yellow range, a sort of 575, 80 nanometer range and that gives its distinctive color. But these lines are unique to 
sodium. So if we, let's say, look at other lines, here we have three other emission spectra which are different in terms of its lines. But these are all unique to specific elements. So this is hydrogen, this here is calcium, and this here is mercury. And so if we can examine any gas that is emitting certain light and analyze it, if we can specifically isolate their lines and match it to what we know for the materials, we can work out the chemical composition of that gas, no matter how far we are away from it. So a classic example here is what we refer to as the Helix Nebula. And it's one of my favorite Hubble images. And these are massive plumes of gas, but the colors here can be analyzed, even though it is millions of light years away. The blue represents oxygen, the reds within this represents the presence of sulfur, and green represents both nitrogen and hydrogen. So from a long distance, we can actually determine the chemical composition of astronomical structures. So how does a spectrometer work? Well, a spectrometer simply analyzes the light that is coming through a diffraction grating in our case, and that diffraction causes the light to diffract. And the amount of diffraction that takes place is related to a number of variables. Now, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time discussing how diffraction actually works. That is going to be the subject of another video. But suffice to say, I'm just going to introduce you to the diffraction formula, d sine theta equals m lambda. Now, what do they represent? D represents the distance between the individual slits. So if I have a thousand line diffraction grating, that means I have a thousand lines per millimeter. And so I have a D value of 10 to by the negative six. If for example, I have a coarser diffraction grating, so let's say 100 lines per millimeter, I'll only have 10 to the power of negative four as my distance here. And so it's a larger value here. The sign of the angle or the angle is the angle that we have measured from the central line. So obviously for red, which has a longer wavelength, has a larger angle and so violet, it's going to be a smaller angle here. M is called your order and this happens multiple times along the way. In other words, you're gonna have another rainbow further down this track if you keep the angles going further and they are the different orders, but we won't worry about that. We'll just treat that as one in our case. Now, here we have white, of course, because there's no diffraction taking place. So white light is going to hit that section there. But what happens if we introduce not white light, what will we get if I introduce, let's say light that is produced by a hydrogen lamp? I'm going to get in this case, not a continuous spectrum, I'm gonna get an emission spectrum. And so my light is spread out, but because I only have very discrete wavelengths, I'm going to get only discrete lines. And these lines, of course, are very specific wavelengths determined by the actual properties of hydrogen. In other words, they're the hydrogen fingerprint. So here's Tom going to demonstrate how he sees the lines. Tom. So uh, this is the equipment we have at the School of Physics uh, here at Sydney University. Now you'd all be pretty familiar with uh, these things here which we normally use in schools. Basically a diffraction grating on the end and a slit on the other. There's a bit of a window here so we can see the values of the lines. But this is the, uh, the more precise equipment that we use. And it's all about uh, spectroscopy, trying to find the signature lines that, co that have come out from a different element. The equipment we have is the hydrogen emission lamp. You can see the uh, little purple line there. The spectrometer here, which breaks the hydrogen into its component colors, and part of that is the diffraction grating, which breaks, which breaks the light open. And the way that the uh, hydrogen spectrum works is, of course, we have a bunch of different electrons with different energies. The hydrogen lamp is given energy from, uh, from the electricity. It jumps up into different energy fields and then falls back down to level two. It also falls down to level one and three, but they're different things. We won't talk about that right now. It falls down into level two. We call this the Barmer series, and we can see that because the amount that it drops is exactly equivalent to a, a photon of light, uh, exactly equivalent to a wavelength that we can see. 
So let's have a look inside the spectrometer so to see what we can see. So if we have a look at the spectrum now, what we'll see when we look straight through here is just that purple line because we're not having any of the light diffracted. What I'll do is I'll move it slightly over here to the angle that we need, which is about there, and what we'll see is a purple line because purple has been diffracted less. If I move it a little bit further, we'll see we'll see the blue line, and then again further out here, we can see a red line. There are a couple of other colors in this hydrogen spectrum, but this machine, uh, this spectrometer, is not uh, precise enough to pick those up. Thanks, Tom, but how do we actually measure the actual angles? By that, we need a particular scale on the actual device. So this is a wonderful piece of kit. This is a precision instruments that we get in some high schools, but not all. You have an angular vernier scale here. So you have the degrees going around on the main uh, ring around, and then we have a fine vernier scale now, depending on how old your spectrometer is, you'll either have a vernier scale that will measure to tenths of a degree, so a bit like with vernier calipers, and you see where the light, um, you see where the zero is to see what integer number you have of degrees, and then you see where the lines line up to get the tenth of a degree. Or you might have an older spectrometer like this one, and the older ones tend to be the best, where it actually measures to minutes. So this actually has a scale up to 20 minutes, and then we've got thirds within each degree here. So 20 minutes is 20 sixtieths, so that's one third. So we would count how many degrees, then how many thirds of a degree, or 20 minutes, and then how many twentieths of a degree on top. So we can actually get some precision um, results here. Uh, which is fantastic, particularly when the beauty of this experiment as well is we know the results, we know the values of the wavelengths of the Barmer series. So we can actually compare our measurements against the scientific theory, against the physics, and, and, and compare those results. Um, the physics behind the diffraction rating is an important part of high school physics as well, just with the equation um, and the relationship for the different orders. So we actually have a very fine diffraction grating here. It's a thousand millimeters, a, a, a thousand lines per millimeter. So the angles that you saw Tom sweeping through, they're quite large angles for the first order. But then they would repeat again. So you get the purple and then the blue and then the red further around. But this is diffracting so much, we'll be limited for the numbers of orders. If we had a coarser diffraction grating, let's say 100 lines per millimeter, then you'd actually see them quite close together, the purple, blue, red, then it'd be for the second order, purple, blue, red, all the way around. Um, and from a methodology point of view, you could actually determine the angle by measuring, let's say, the blue line to the left for the first order, blue line to the right for the first order, calculate that total angle, and then divide by two for theta. So just a bit of experimentation there. So what I find really interesting is the way that technology has helped us uh, find better, better measurements and better results. This is quite old equipment, uh, but it's still very good, it's still very useful. We upgrade to slightly more uh, usable pieces of equipment like this. Up till now, when we can start using this stuff with our phones. Uh, so most of our phones have a bit of a, a camera on the back. And you won't be able to see this, but we can take some, some screenshots of it. This is a tiny little diffraction grating. You can get these from, from some of those kids' toys where you hold them up to the light and they see, you, know, you see rainbows and stuff, or a back of a CD. If you can put this over the top of your phone, which is very simple, just covering the camera, and then you hold that up, you'll start to see uh, the diffraction gratings or the, the lines of hydrogen or any other light uh, that, that's uh, coming out of a, a lamp like this. Uh, on your phone, which you can then count the, the pixels between each one and then calculate the angles from that. It's pretty powerful, just with a simple phone and a piece of plastic. Cool. Let's have a look, a close look at it. Let's do it. And if I shine, if I point the camera towards uh, the hydrogen lamp, you can see off to the left, we've got the purple, blue and red lines pretty clearly. 
Uh, as Simon was saying, we've got the same thing on the other side. And that's the, the first order. We can go all the way out to the side and probably start to see some of the second order. There you go, there's the purple and the second order. It starts to get a little bit um, dim after that. With our phones, if I can take a photo of that, I'm just going to focus on the dark light. And there we have the, uh, the spectrum line from hydrogen, which we could use with a pixel counter, which is probably a free app somewhere, uh, and count the number of pixels, uh, therefore the angle, and work out exactly the, 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 uh, the wavelengths of those, those lights. The cool thing is it doesn't just work with hydrogen, we can do the same thing with all of the other lights we've got. I'm just going to flick this around so we can see this one. That is neon, I think. Isn't that cool? Just with a phone. Amazing. Well, I hope that's given you a better understanding of spectroscopy. I hope uh, you continue to f follow the channel, like and subscribe. Check out Crooked Science with Simon over here and also the Kickstart program at the University of Sydney. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.